The dark, dingy stairwell matched the New York City skyline perfectly. It had been raining for days. Shaking out her umbrella, which beautifully matched her purse and outfit, a design she had come up with back home in Raleigh, she makes her way up the stairs, locating the office she's looking for. Third door on the right. The sign on the door reads, B. L. Henry Company of New York. She has an idea. She always has ideas. Ideas she believes will make the lives of everyday women easier and more enjoyable. The trick has always been expressing what's in her mind clearly enough for a manufacturer to create a model or prototype. She has walked through countless doors many times only to be told her ideas wouldn't work, that they were impossible or impractical. But it was not in her nature to give up. In fact, quite the opposite. Every time they told her something couldn't be done, she became even more determined to prove them wrong. So where does a daring young woman with a head full of ingenious ideas go? What door could she possibly open that would allow her to fully express her creativity and bring her ideas to life? Reaching for the doorknob, she smiles briefly to herself, steps over the threshold, and realizes she has entered a place where the possibilities are endless a world of inspiration and innovation. How does she know this? Because it's her name on the third door on the right. Welcome to the Aquitaine Project, a podcast all about learning from yesterday how we can shine today and create a brighter tomorrow. I'm Marlo Mead, your host, guide, and fellow traveler, on a journey where together we'll draw upon the lessons, wisdom, and experiences of women past and present, women I like to call my bright lighters. Each episode, I'll bring to light their stories, voices, and legacies, inspiring each of us to become bright lighters in our own right. For me, these women transcend time, teaching us lessons we can use in our own lives each and every day, shining their light from different centuries, cultures, and corners of the earth. They light the way, making it possible for us to create our own light and shine it forward. So. If you're ready to step into the light of some pretty cool women and learn a little, grow a little, laugh a little, and shine a lot, stick around. The creative process is one of the most complex and beautiful parts of being human. It's messy, frustrating, and enjoyable, and shows up differently for everyone. For some, creativity is expressed through singing, dancing, writing, or painting. For others, creativity is grounded in math and science, where numbers and data tell the story. And then there are the idea people. You know, the people who continuously come up with ingenious ideas. The inventors, rebels, and mutineers who see the world a little differently than others. The ones who say, I have a new idea for that, or who always see ways to improve something and make it better. Let's face it, without creativity and the inspired people who can take an idea, a thought, a theory, and turn it into reality, there would be no progress in the world. I believe we all have a creative spark, and how we choose to express our creativity is as unique as we are. 
Referred to by some as Lady Edison, this episode's Bright Lighter was a natural-born problem solver with a creative mind and an indomitable spirit. Her story shows us the impact creativity and innovation can have on the world. Beulah Louise Henry was the most prolific female inventor of the first half of the 20th century. At the age of six, Beulah's little mind was already thinking of ways to make things better or to create new machines that would make people's lives easier. While she enjoyed painting and music as a child, her favorite hobby was to point out things that she saw wrong and describe changes or innovations that could be made to improve them. One of her first ideas was a mechanical hat tipper that would tip a man's hat automatically when he greeted someone. By the age of nine, she was drawing sketches of her ideas and had created her first prototype, a belt with a paper holder attached after she had seen a man struggling to read the newspaper and carry his groceries at the same time. Like many of her later inventions, Beulah's work was the product of careful observation and problem solving. She was born in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1887. Her father was a doctor and her mother a homemaker. While she did attend college briefly, she had no formal mechanical engineering training. What she did have was a keen sense of awareness and abundant curiosity, which fueled her creative inspiration and innovation, which, by the way, are two different things. More about that a little later. When Beulah got a new idea, her creative mind developed a complete picture of the finished product. She could see the whole process laid out before her. But describing her ideas clearly enough for a model maker to reproduce her ideas and create prototypes was a more difficult challenge. But she persevered, and in 1912, Beulah received her first patent for a vacuum-sealed ice cream freezer a device that makes ice cream using ice, salt, milk, and sugar without all the cranking that was required in earlier manual ice cream makers. So, if you love ice cream, you can thank Beulah Louise for making the process easier and smoother. And you all know I love good butter pecan ice cream. The following year, she earned two more patents, one for a handbag, another for an umbrella, both with interchangeable, detachable cloth covers in a variety of colors. The ultimate accessory, ladies. Who doesn't need an umbrella to match their every outfit? I love this idea. This brawly, as umbrellas were called back in the day, was all the rage for many years. And I happen to know for a fact there is a modern-day company that makes covers for purses, allowing you to change the look and color anytime you want. Beulah was surely ahead of her time. The success of her umbrella idea prompted her to move to New York City, the mecca of manufacturing during the early part of the 20th century. Over the next several decades, Beulah continued devising all types of products and acquired several more patents, including a hair curler, a football inflator, a sponge that held soap in the middle, and the equipment that manufactured the sponges. She created the first double-chain stitch bobbinless sewing machine that revolutionized the sewing industry. She also invented more than a dozen typewriter components, including an accessory known as a protograph, which was an attachment that allowed a typewriter to produce an original plus four duplicate copies without the use of carbon paper. Some of you probably have no idea what carbon paper is. In 1940, she claimed to have designed a silent typewriter, relatively quiet, that is. Inspired by her visit to an office where the click, 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 click of typewriter keys was very distracting. Beulah became very well known in the toy industry also, especially for her mechanically sophisticated dolls, including a spring-limbed doll, which was capable of various arm and leg movements. The Miss Illusion doll had eyes that changed colors at the touch of a button. Oh, no offense, Beulah Louise, but I still find those old dolls slightly terrifying. She was also issued a patent for her invention, the radio doll. This doll had a functioning radio mounted inside, and another patent for her kitty clock, which helped children learn time. Many of her innovative toy inventions were sold to toy and doll manufacturers. 
By age 37, Beulah had so many products under development that she formed two companies. The B.L. Henry Company of New York, which managed and promoted her various inventions, and the Henry Umbrella and Parasol Company, which manufactured and marketed the immensely popular umbrella she had invented. She also served as president of both companies. Having earned a reputation as a professional inventor throughout the 1950s and 60s, Beulah was hired by other companies to develop products for them, ranging from household devices to envelope machines. While many of her inventions were patented in the names of the companies who hired her, Beulah Louise Henry was atypical among early women inventors in that she was able to profit from her inventions and received credit during her lifetime for her prolific portfolio of products. Say that three times fast. She was well known as a self-sufficient and charming figure in New York City society. She never married and devoted most of her time to her many interests. Beulah Louise Henry died in 1973 and is credited with approximately 110 inventions and 49 patents. Her whole life revolved around an inspired creative process, taking ideas from conception to completion with the focus of making life easier and more convenient for women. And although her 49 patents may seem small compared with those of many male inventors of her time, they loom large in comparison with those of other women inventors. In the early 20th century, less than 2% of the patents issued by the U.S. Patent Office were granted to women. In 2006, Beulah was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. An inventor, a rebel in her own way, and a thought leader in today's terms, Beulah Louise has a thing or two to teach us about tapping into the inspiration that is all around us and trusting our creative side to make things happen. Beulah Henry once told the press, I invent because I cannot help it. For many of us, we create, design, compose, write, innovate, and invent like Beulah because we can't help it. It's what we were born to do. Sometimes we latch on to an idea that grabs a hold of us and refuses to let go. It might be an idea about a new way to do something or to improve an existing process or product. It may also be a creative endeavor that we dream of bringing to life. I think of myself as a pretty creative person. I have creative ideas all the time. They float around my head like little birds chirping at me. Pick me. Pick me. No, pick me. Here's an example. I currently have three book ideas, a plan to build a better brush, creative ideas for making a giant pine cone wreath, that one's been stuck in my head for a few years now, and a multitude of jewelry design ideas. Then, there are the great ideas I have about the Aquitaine project. Believe me, it can get a bit crowded and noisy in my head sometimes. In the book, The Four Agreements, A Practical Guide to Personal Freedom, Don Miguel Ruiz states it beautifully. You can have many great ideas in your head, but what makes the difference is the action. Without action upon an idea, there will be no manifestation, no result, and no reward. Could not have said it better myself. Thanks, Miguel. But what exactly is creativity and how does it differ from innovation? It seems to me they are both related and necessary in expressing our ideas and making them real. According to the American Psychological Association, the APA for short, the traditional psychological definition of creativity includes two parts, originality and functionality. You can't be creative unless you come up with something that hasn't been done before, says psychologist Dean Keith Simonton, Ph.D. of the University of California, Davis. The idea also has to work or be adaptive or be functional in some way. It has to meet some criteria of usefulness. I personally find this definition a bit too limiting. It makes sense when dealing with creating and inventing physical mechanical things like the rotisserie spit for my barbecue grill or the microphone I use to record my podcast. But what about creating music or art or literature? It doesn't make sense to me to put them in such a narrowly defined box. I much prefer the definition of creativity offered up by Linda Nyman, founder of Creativity at Work. 
Linda states, Creativity is the act of turning new and imaginative ideas into reality. It is characterized by the ability to perceive the world in new ways, to find hidden patterns, to make connections between seemingly unrelated phenomena, and to generate solutions. Creativity involves two processes, thinking, then producing. If you have ideas but don't or are unable to act on them, you are imaginative but not necessarily creative. I suppose many of us are both imaginative and creative. Some ideas stay just that, ideas roaming around our brains, while other ideas we bring to life by taking active steps to turn them into reality. So, what then is innovation? Referring back to the APA, innovation is defined as the successful implementation of a creative idea. Some suggest that although creativity needs to be truly novel, innovation can be the adaptation of ideas in the current environment. I can agree with that. Now, my new friend Linda would say, innovation is the implementation of a new or significantly improved product, service, or process that creates value for business, government, or society. Linda goes on to say that some people say creativity has nothing to do with innovation, that innovation is a discipline, implying that creativity is not. Well, I disagree. Creativity is also a discipline and is a crucial part of the innovation equation. There is no innovation without creativity. I'm going to repeat that. There is no innovation without creativity. The key metric in both creativity and innovation is value creation. No, I don't know Linda personally, but I like her take on the subject. And yes, I'll include a link to her site on the Aquitaine Project website. Wow. That was a lot of information to try to remember. Let's see if I can summarize and simplify. Creativity is about coming up with the big idea, what could be, while innovation is improving upon something that already exists. The key that brings both creative ideas and innovative ideas to life is execution. Execution is what converts ideas into an invention, a product, a song, a painting, a book, a podcast. It's what separates the dreamers from the doers. And boy, was Beulah Louise Henry a doer. Her ingenious mind fully embraced what I call the ICI plus E process. Inspiration, creation, innovation, plus execution. See how creative I am? I just made that up. The process works like this. Beulah noticed all umbrellas were black. This inspired her to come up with an idea to create colorful detachable covers for ladies' umbrellas that would match their outfits. Now, she did not invent the umbrella. She came up with an innovative idea to make umbrellas more fashionable. Then, she created a model of her idea took it to a manufacturer who executed the idea and turned it into a marketable product. And that's how ICI plus E works. Beulah's story exemplifies how we can harness our own ICI plus E and unleash our inner creativity and mad genius to make ourselves and the world happier, better, and a bit more interesting. Pablo Picasso said, All children are artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. Think about when you were a kid. You were naturally curious, imaginative, and creative. If I gave the four-year-old you a big box and some crayons, you could turn that box into a rocket ship, a race car, a boat, a playhouse, any number of things. Throw in some pillows and a blanket and you could build a full-blown fort. But somewhere along the path from childhood to adulthood, many of us lose our inner creative child. At some point, some well-meaning yet misguided teacher, family member, or friend says we'd be better off finding something else we're more suited to. You can't make a living being an artist, a writer, a dancer, etc., etc., etc. So, The key that we used to unlock our imagination gets stuffed in a drawer, and our curiosity about the world is squelched because the world around us tells us to get our heads out of the clouds. 
stop daydreaming, and concentrate on the business of making a living instead of creating a life. A life where being curious, imaginative, and creative, whether artistically, scientifically, personally, or professionally, is the rule, not the exception. In a 2007 TED Talk given by Sir Ken Robinson, titled, Do Schools Kill Creativity?, Robinson surmises that it is the education system in its rigidly structured hierarchy of educational subjects, which almost universally places the arts at the bottom and ruthlessly squanders the natural creativity and talents of kids. According to Robinson, creativity is just as important as literacy and should be treated with the same status. I wholeheartedly agree. Supporting our kids in their creative endeavors should be just as important as supporting every other aspect of their growth and development. Our creativity is a natural expression of who we are. It helps us see life in a new way, in a new light, to perceive a new dimension, a deeper way of encountering what we know. This is why, as I said earlier, I believe we each have the gift of creativity, a creative spark, if you will. The goal is to accept and nurture our creative gifts and fan the spark into a flame to see what wonderful things we can create. So, how do we tap into that creative side of ourselves, the side that has all those big, beautiful, bright ideas and bring some or all of them into the world? If you're like Beulah Louise Henry, your creative ideas and innovations come to mind fully formed, ready to be created, manufactured, or adapted, and born into the world. Beulah's gift was a type of reverse mental engineering where she could see the end product or design, then work backward to bring it to life. I'm willing to bet most of us, creatively speaking, work beginning to end instead of end to beginning. I know that's how my creative brain works. For me, the creative process goes something like this. I get an idea. It starts out small and vague. Sometimes it's fleeting and doesn't stick around. But other times, the idea begins to germinate, like a seed. It keeps growing and growing in my mind until it reaches the point that it grabs my full attention. At this point, I stop what I'm doing and write it down. I developed this habit after countless times not being able to remember all my brilliant ideas that were going to change the world. Next, I share the idea with my board of creative directors, aka my family. We Meads are a very creative bunch who, in their very loving, supportive, collaborative way, find all the roses and thorns in my idea. Now, at this point, if I choose to act on the idea, I devote some time to fleshing it out, filling in the gaps, and adding new ideas to the mix. If I don't, it begins to linger at the back of my mind. It may fade away and die. Or, gradually, it tries to push its way forward, yelling louder and louder, Hey, remember me? This is exactly what happened with my idea of creating the Aquitaine Project. I had the idea, I didn't act on it, and almost 15 years went by, but the idea never left me. It hung on for dear life. I'm not sure how much longer it would have hung around, but I am reminded every day how important it is to take action on an idea and not store it away in a safe deposit box at the end of a long to-do list. Because, if and when it's revisited, chances are it might be gone. My point is, creativity is and should be something we work to develop, nurture, and share with the world. Luckily, the Aquitaine Project kept yelling and yelling and yelling until I finally took the idea and turned it into reality. Several years ago, my son introduced me to the book Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. In the book, she discusses the attitudes, approaches, and habits we need in order to live our most creative lives. One of my favorite passages from the book goes like this. We are inherently creative. Be an artist. Create for the sake of creating, because creative living is where the big magic will always be. So, here are a few ways we can keep our creativity flowing. 1. Don't be afraid to fail. If you don't fail, you don't learn, you don't grow. Being creative means taking risks and expressing yourself authentically. There is no innovation without failure. Trust yourself. 
This goes for your personal creativity as well as your professional creativity. Now more than ever, creative ideas are needed to solve increasingly complex business problems. Don't let fear stand in the way of making important contributions to your organization. If you have new ideas, share them. If you see ways to improve processes or products, speak up. Being creative and business savvy are not, as Beulah shows us, mutually exclusive. 2. Don't listen to the noise. Well-meaning people will tell you to pursue a different career or you're not cut out to be an artist, a dancer, or an engineer. It's your path. It's your creativity. Don't let doubt get in the way. Express your creativity in whatever way feels right to you. As Sylvia Plath stated, the worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt. 3. Embracing the spirit of fun, excitement, and childlike wonder is key to finding and nurturing your creative gifts. Make friends with your inner creative child. She knows exactly which drawer the key is in. I know. We can all get way too busy in our everyday lives to even think about pursuing our creative ideas and the work it might take to bring them into the world. But imagine just how much more magical your life might be if you allowed yourself to follow your creative spirit. I, for one, believe it's worth the time, energy, and effort. Journalists of the day often referred to Beulah Louise Henry as the Lady Edison a female version of the famous male inventor, due to her prolific number of inventions. Today, I think we would regard her not as the Lady Edison, but as the true visionary she was. Many of her early inventions are prototypes for tools and innovations that we use today, such as curling irons, soap-filled sponges, envelope machines, and more efficient sewing machines. She set out to improve the lives of everyday women, and she certainly did. Beulah was also a pivotal figure and a pioneer in worlds that have been dominated by men for a very long time. Science, manufacturing, engineering, and business. Her creativity, drive, and resourcefulness, and her business savvy light the way for girls and women of today, the next generation of inventors and innovators. She cleared the path for us to dream outside of society's expectations and inspires us to pursue a life in areas that were thought to be a man's world. And for that, I thank her. So, in honor of this amazingly imaginative and creative Brightlighter, let's challenge ourselves to tap into our creative side, to take risks, to trust ourselves, and share our bright ideas with the world. Why I love this woman. She lived by the motto, there's a better way of doing that, and she usually proved it. Beulah was ambitious and independent, and her creative mind and good business sense proved to the world a woman inventor could be successful in her own right. Her life serves as a reminder that no matter what we want to do in life, when we trust our inner creativity, we can, as Austin Kleon so beautifully states, draw the art we want to see. Start the business we want to run. Play the music we want to hear. Write the book we want to read. Build the products we want to use. And do the work we want to see done. For me, Beulah Louise Henry is the mother of invention and the bright lighter that teaches us how to harness our creativity and bring our own ideas to life. To learn more about the life, creations, and innovations of Beulah Henry, visit the Aquitaine Project podcast website at www.theaquitaineproject.com and click on Beulah's portrait. There you'll find links about her awesome career as an innovator, as well as resources to help you discover and unleash your own creativity. I hope you'll connect with me on Instagram at The Aquitaine Project, LinkedIn, just look for Marlo Mead, and on Facebook at The Aquitaine Project Podcast Group. You can also find the podcast on my YouTube channel, The Aquitaine Project. Until next time, my bright lighters, imagine great things and let your creativity shine bright. Yeah.